From Boca Raton, Florida, Rabbis Ephraim Goldberg, Philip Moskowitz, and Josh Brody are taking you Behind the Bema. The BRS rabbis schmooze about contemporary issues and talk to special guests who give a behind-the-scenes look at how they got to where they are and what keeps them going. Welcome to Behind the Bema. Wednesday night, 9 p.m. I'm your host, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, joined by my dear colleagues and friends, Rabbi Philip Moskowitz and Rabbi Josh Brody, and we are here to take you... Behind the Bema. We're here to take you behind the Bema. This is our second to last episode of this season before we take a little wow. break. We've got, an, we've got a great episode lined up for next week in advance of Father's Day. We've got a father-son combo, high-profile, super exciting interview. But first, this week we've got a great interview. I know one of Rabbi Moskowitz's heroes as a runner. He has been uh, following, tracking, pun intended, her uh, career. And we're super excited to welcome shortly BD Deutsch onto our show. But first... Let's mention our two sponsors that we have. One, uh, Danny and Emily Agion, in honor of Stu Krause and Rene Moskowitz, and in memory of their dear son, Alex Krause, of blessed memory, for being so open-hearted, generous during Danny's recovery. Their son's neshama should have an aliyah, and Hashem should hear all Kalah Yisrael. Super grateful to the Agions for that sponsorship. And uh, we're thinking about our buddy Danny. Danny's a hero. As if Danny didn't, like, have it all going already and make us look bad in every other way brain surgeon, good-looking, learner, spiritual, Amuna. he like has it all. And he was like, you know what? Take my kidney. Here it is. <laughs> so Danny, like many others in our community, heroically donated his kidney to a total stranger this week. Thank God he and the recipient are recovering well. Danny, we're thinking about you. We love you. We're inspired by you. And they should continue to heal and do well. And a big thank you to the Krauses for helping him. Also, tonight is sponsored by Fran and David Wolf in honor of Rabbi Moskowitz, Rabbi Brody, and a little bit me, in honor of the launch of his new book. So David Wolf, my buddy, put out this new book called Torah IQ. Torah IQ, it's a collection of over 1,500 questions and riddles and conundrums, parsha, holidays, halacha, brachos. It's got tremendous approbations. It's fun. I got it here. I used it in my parsha class just yesterday. And we're going to pose one question for our listeners and viewers. Should we offer a prize? Some swag if someone gets it right? Rabbi Brody, should we pose you any of these questions? 1,500 <laughs> riddles. Coming, coming soon to Audible. Coming soon to Audible. This is, um, it's divided by Parsha, really well organized, you can see on the side. And in the back, there's a Halacha section. I'm not sure why this is in the Halacha section, but are you ready? Uh, this is, now I, it is a Halacha question. Okay, that was dumb. Here we go. There are four listeners, fact checker not included among them, by the way. Fact checker is ineligible just because he's the kind of guy that would know the answer. There are four male babies born within one hour of each other in the same time zone. All are born Jewish, all are healthy, and yet they have their bris on four consecutive days. Why? Four male babies born within one hour of each other in the same time zone. All are born Jewish, all are healthy, and yet they have their bris milas on four consecutive days. Question is, why? If you know that answer, feel free to write it in the comments. Feel free to email or get in touch with us. Tweet it to Behind the Bema on Twitter, and you will be eligible potentially to win a prize. Potentially because we have to figure out what the prize is. Maybe a copy of Torah IQ. <laughs> what do you say, David Wolf? David That's Wolf nice will send you a copy, of, an autographed copy of, da- of David Wolf. I highly recommend it. It's great. If you're looking for your Shabbos table, like great conversation, great questions, provocative. It's a great, great book. I already looked through it, and I highly recommend it. And thank you for co-sponsoring tonight. This is why we need BRS swag for moments like this. It's in production. It's part By of the way, summer. I, it's in production. I, I spoke to Josh at Renewal yesterday. He told me a great story about, about Danny. He said, you know, Danny originally came to become to be tested to see if he was uh, going to be a donor at our event that we had at uh, at BRS to test for someone that was looking for a kidney. Right. He was actually a match with that guy. But right. the, that guy actually got a kidney from someone else, but because Danny was now in the system because of the event at BRS, he matched with this other donor. The, the story is even better than that because you know Danny called them and many other people would be like, "Look, I tried. I was willing. Right. They don't need me. They don't need me." Danny's like, what, what do you mean? Like one second, that's not fair. I, I want to give my kidney. I want to save a life. As, <laughs> as, if, as if he doesn't do that every day as a, as a brain surgeon. So it's, it's really special. And I don't want to start to list because I don't want to leave anyone out. But we have many members and we know many people. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to live and know that you saved a life. 
It's really extraordinary. It's really, really special. Uh, rabbis, how, how was your week? We, um, we spoke last, was it last week's episode? We talked about the book that we've not written. First of all, it's interesting. Somebody who obviously listened to it a day or two later texted me, by the way, what book would you write? Because no offense to you guys, but you never asked me. You never followed up. But Rabbi Brody, you mentioned the book that you would write, which I think is a great book. I'm already, I've pre-ordered. It's being, it's being I've written pre-ordered. already. But several times since then. An, we just wrote another chapter last night, by the way. Several times since then, including last night in a meeting, we've seen Rabbi Brody get a little bit heated, a little excited. Heated, passionate. A little bit, a little bit passionate about certain issues. Gen- and generous and word for it. And now we yeah. have the great opportunity to say, Rabbi Brody, don't forget the name of your book. And he says, and he's reacted to his credit. <laughs> You're right. I'm just going to relax. I just have to relax. So what We're is it? Relax? Students. That's the name? All, just relax? All still, all still learning. Just Wait, relax. So Rabbi, That's the name, though. Rabbi Goldberg, what is the name of your book? I I thought we had given you a chance to, but sometimes you go on to another topic. We can't get it in there. Yeah, so. and I don't need to talk so about it. So what's your, no, no, but I want to hear it now. The, the world nah, I don't want to talk about me. Let's breath. talk about vacation. Maybe by the time I come back from vacation, I'll have the book. Maybe. You never know. You never know. Not going to happen. Not but happen. in the meantime, <laughs> vacation coming up, uh, at least for me. You, you came back from a little vacation over in Moscow. So your main vacation is going to be a little bit later in the summer. Rabbi Brody's sort of always on vacation. And I'm going on vacation. Just joking. You work very hard. We know that. We know that. But I'm really excited. I don't know that I've ever needed it as badly. I'm not looking for anyone's sympathy. Don't play your little violin. I'm just saying that Corona was... There was, there was no downtime. The, the decision fatigue and the... Um, Constantly trying to evaluate, keep people happy, do the best we could, teach our classes, give chizuk. None of us took last summer off. Normally we get a healthy break in the summer. So I have been looking forward to this now for two years and very excited to spend that time with my family, spend that time with myself, get to know who I am, think a little bit about the summers for me. It's about trying to rediscover who I am when I take off the rabbi persona. Who, who am I? Strip that away. Dive in the back of a room. What kind of learning do I do when I'm not teaching it to others? How do I live my life when I'm not trying to think about what to put into a sermon or to an article? And just to go back to living as, as a Eved Hashem, as a regular person, and to figure out who I am. So unplugging and decompressing, I'm, I feel like I'm running on fumes a little bit. And again, not looking for anyone's sympathy. You know, everybody works hard. Everybody could use that break, but very excited for my break this summer. Well, we are excited for you. You deserve it. And I know, again, because from personal experiences and from watching you now 11 years, you're, you, know, you become a better person when you go on vacation. It's important to take time off, as you said, to reflect upon who you are and what your values are, what your priorities are, to remind yourself that you're a father first. And um, you come back, you're re-energized, you're recharged, your Shemona Esra is better. It's just, it's so important. And I don't think, you know, we oftentimes, we, we're so running and we're going on fumes. We need to remember sometimes that like in running, where you have to have recovery in the middle because it helps you become a stronger runner going forward, life is the exact same way. And I'm just going to say, I don't think you're having enough of a vacation. And I mean that. I think you know what I mean a little bit. Because sometimes when you go to places which are very popular and they know who you are, and then you don't really get to be you know, the, 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 you know, off. You're still on. And it's very, yeah, very difficult. All, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And there, there is a little point where we're going away. Rustic Elegance, my good friend Yitzhi Kesak runs a phenomenal program. I've had the privilege to participate. This will be our second time. We went to Montana, Glacier National Park. In the summer, we're going to Yellowstone National Park. The truth is our trip is already filled. There's no room left. Uh, people coming from all over. I can't wait to meet them, spend time with them, learn with them, hike with them. Yeah, but that's not a vacation. That's, yeah, no, that, that, that part's that's being out there with nature, with God. You're <laughs> Right, it's giving classes. That part is not. You just listed like, you listed more things you're doing in that week on vacation than most rabbis do in this country right. for the whole year. No, no, so no. I'm that's, just, that's, I'm that's, just telling that's you vacation. That. <laughs> that's vacation. What I really need, what I really wanted to talk about for the few minutes before we welcome BD on, um, is talking about how you how you go on vacation because the truth is next Shemitah year in Israel and the Torah tells us we know since the beginning of time that human beings need to unplug. We need to disconnect. We all know it ourselves. Lahavdil. Your laptop or your or your um, or your phone. Did I tell the story on behind the BMO with the plane? Because this we were all there. Do you remember we once flew to Washington? It was an APAC emergency for the Iran issue. We were flying back, we're run. on the plane. We, we were going down the runway, and as the front of the of the plane lifted up, it then went back down and we screeched to a halt and the pilot came back on and he said you know, uh, yeah, we're going to uh, head back to the gate. As we're about to lift off, a, uh, 
And the emergency light came issue. on. I remember. Not, you remember really? he said, not really sure what that light is or what it indicates. And as we were pulling up, I figured probably better off going back to the gate and figuring it out. So we pull back to the gate. Right. And, uh, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes go by. He comes on. He said, listen, we got the manual up here. We're trying to figure out what this light is. <laughs> so nothing's smoke. working. So we're going to actually open the door. You can feel go back in the airport if you want. Right. We're going to re... You know, we'll come back on the plane again once we figure Reboot. it out. So as we were getting off the plane, I, I leaned into the cockpit and I, I maybe inappropriately made a joke and I said, have you just tried rebooting the plane? You know, like that, that light comes on or the computer gets frozen or your phone doesn't work. You just got to restart it. You got to reboot it. He was not nearly as amused as I was, but we got off, went inside, you know, paid an enormous amount of money for some drink and snack, and it wasn't that long. We got back no, on the no, plane. By the way, one, not everyone got the postscript. You, you can give the postscript in a minute. Not everybody got back on the plane, but we, we got back on the plane, yeah. and um, and when we did, I sat down. We were all listening, waiting to find out what happened, and the pilot comes out. He says, yeah, we never figured out exactly what that light is, but we restarted the plane and the light's not on, so we're going to give it a shot. We're going to give it a go. So anyway, what I took from that story is in life, sometimes you got to you got to disconnect, you got to reboot, you got to restart, you got to just you got to power down a little bit and stay in the off position for a little bit. You ever have that? Your Wi-Fi is not working at home, your kids are going crazy. What's going on? Comcast says it's not their fault. So you just you unplug everything. You leave it for a few minutes. You yeah. replug it in, and all of a sudden, you don't need to know how it worked. It, you know, no one needs to know. Mysteriously, it worked. Shmita, the land, let it go. So we've got to unplug. So we all have to. And you're right, Rabbi Brody. By the way, I think this is a general, all of us, my, I'm at the top of this list, are addicted to work, addicted to technology, addicted to being connected. Every day we have the ability to go offline of life for ability. So every day of the week, you know, every week, sorry, Shabbos, we do it. Uh, every month we can get away for a day, a night, whatever, disconnect. We all have to be scheduling a lot more, but I'm, I'm really excited for it for the summer. Well, you're not going to tell me. Like when you're not. No, no, we're not going to tell the the post. We're not going. We're not outing that. We're no, not I'm outing not the other say, I'm not going to say who it is. There were four rabbis on the plane, <laughs> and only three got back on. One of them was very nervous about getting on a plane where there was a technical challenge. There was smoke coming and out. And I of believe danger. I believe we landed much earlier. Right? He he tried to change his flight. No, no, yeah. no. He did. No, you know what happened? We went into the airport. We went to the overpriced concession place and he's at the desk at jet blue getting a new after flight like, after like what are you doing he's like, like where is he <laughs> minute. Wait a minute. I, I just i just i booked the next flight we're like why they said we're gonna go back on yeah. he's like i'm not going on that plane <laughs> they, they don't know why that light came on no chance i'm getting back no on that chance. plane yeah you know what the good news was we're i had here. a story for, i had a story for the drusha that shabbos so <laughs> right used it we used it but anyway but here's my question that i've been wanting to talk about for a couple weeks and, and we want to bring bd on so just for a couple minutes but rabbi brody you're my hero in many ways, so just relax, relax. But one of the reasons you're my hero is you took notifications off your phone. Not just social media, but you don't know if email's there, you don't know if a phone call came in, you don't know if a WhatsApp came in, and you'll look at it on your time. When you have a minute, when you're ready to check WhatsApp, you'll open it up and see if there's anything new, but you're not going to allow that phone to notify you. Those little notifications are not going to drive you crazy. What precipitated that decision that means, by the way, what led to that decision? Thank what you. led to it? And how did you have the courage to make it? Do you do you miss the notifications? Do you ever miss out? Was someone trying to get in touch with you that couldn't because you were not looking at that phone? Okay, so first of all, let me articulate the uh, the points here. Number one, <laughs> number one, it was probably something you said in the drush. I remember you were talking about t t tuning out everything else. So. I didn't realize you could actually turn off the notifications. I guess the default is that everything's going to notify. It's going to be things popping up. There's going to be sounds. There's going to be vibrations and everything's going to. And then I think once WhatsApp came out where you're, you're literally beeping every second, it just became a little bit, a little bit overwhelming. When I found that you can turn it all off, everything changed. Everything changed overnight. And you realize that nothing's so urgent. What's, what's so urgent? And, and the few people that I know need to get in touch with me, the rabbis, Simone, Matt, Marla, whoever it might be, Larry, automatically. Yeah, if you didn't make that top six, you're not in the top six. <laughs> there. But I'm still you, waiting because I can't that, was, figure was out your touch with you. Did, did you mention your mom? I don't know if she's in that because it can't be that urgent. I mean, we're talking about things that have to be like right now. Then or, the phone will ring because if I'm in a meeting or if I'm anywhere, then just call me and I'll pick up That's the phone if it's one of you. That's it. So Otherwise, it's, everyone else. It's fascinating you say that because there are – a million times, probably a day, that we're in a WhatsApp group and we're waiting for you to notice or respond and it's so aggravated, but nobody has even a thought, well, why don't we just call them? 
because once in a while you notice I call you once in a while now, but you, you're right. We just it's it's so towards the end of our list of how we would get in touch with how someone is to actually let me ask you a question. Call. Rob, it's, let, it's, let me call, just make it's a, called a phone. <laughs> right. One day we'll understand the orange on the phone also. But Rabbi Goldberg, let's 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 make it a little more practical for some of our listeners. You don't have that luxury. You can't. And if you do, you'll pay yes, for it you later. Do. Right? Let's, say, no, now, let's say Rabbi Goldberg says, I'm not going to turn off all notifications. I'm not going to answer things in real time. You know as well as I do. It's like when you take a day off. You're going to come back at the end of it looking at 3,000 messages, at all of which you have to respond to, and right. you're going to pay for it at the end. And by the way, you do deal with emergencies and crisis where you can't wait two, three hours. Someone passes no, so away. Then, so have them call Lee. Call. And then Lee can call you and it will ring. Right. If it's Robert Brody's saying that you can set up systems where you right. are available for emergencies without being Absolutely. attached to the phone. And he's, he's right about that because there have been circumstances when you're running. If I'm playing tennis in that, you know, and, and I'm trying to not, if you check your phone between games or turnover, it just, it changes your whole rest of your game because now whatever you just saw is in your head. And the beauty of tennis is during the point, you can't think about anything else, just getting that next ball back. Or, or when you're on your run, you know, again, we're going to have BD on. You get into that runner's high, you go into that runner's place. One question we'll ask her, do you listen to things while you run? I'm sure. So, um, you know, Robbie Brody's right about that. I will tell you that something happened to me a couple weeks ago. I was telling somebody how absolutely addicted I've become, attached I am. Not, not, I'm not watching stuff. I'm not, I, I hope I'm not trying to waste time. It's just constantly in real time trying to respond to everything and it's, and it's difficult. So um, there was a, a therapist in town who I work closely with um, and I admire a lot and he asked me, can we meet at Starbucks? Let's catch up, whatever. We sat down. I thought we were going to talk about something that we're working on together and he's like, we're here to talk about you. This is an intervention. I was like, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? So somebody had basically said to him, because I had shared with them how, how attached I was. So I made a commitment. I said, you know, what? I'm going to work on this. I really need to. And um, my anniversary was a couple weeks ago. And I sat down, went out to dinner with Yocheved. I sat down. And the very first thing I did is I, I handed her my phone. This was not the only present. I said, happy anniversary. I handed her my phone. She said, what's that? I said, for our dinner, you're holding my phone. I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to be tempted to look at it. I'm not going to make an excuse to look at it. I'm not going to go to the bathroom so I can look at it. I'm not going to wash so I can look at it. Here's my phone. She held my phone from when we got there till we left. And you know what? When I got to the car, there were a billion notifications, but I lived with it. I got back to them. I cleared them out. I did what I needed to do, but I was fully present while I was there. I'm only bringing this up because one of my goals on vacation is to be working on myself and working on this. I want to try to every day go for a walk where I leave the phone at home. Go across the street, you know, from where I'll be to davening, leave the phone back at the house. Go do whatever whatever I'm doing. Did you feel anxious to be. when she had the phone? You know, there are points of it where, you know, they talk about phantom limb syndrome, where you're like, you know, you're reaching and somebody who's lost a limb still feels like their limb is there even though it's not on. So like the phone is like an extra limb. There are moments where I reached into my pocket or I thought I felt it vibrate or whatever. And then you're like, you know what? I don't have, I don't need it. Fully engaged, yeah. fully invested, fully present. By the way, sometimes it doesn't work out. Rabbi Brody, you had to come get me once. Do you remember that? I was in a very <laughs> present conversation with the, I was at, I was out. And I was in a pr conversation that I wanted to be present for. And my wife decided cool. she needed to get in touch with me. Yeah. And I at wasn't picking up my phone. I, it was all notifications were turned off. It was it, the conversation went on. It was 11 o'clock at night. And my wife started getting nervous. So she started texting pouring. you guys. And she said, do you know where Phil is? And you guys said you thought you'd seen him somewhere. Anyways, all of a sudden, I see Rabbi Brody come walking up to me. It's like 1130 <laughs> at night. I'm like, what are you doing here? He's like, buddy, you got to call your wife oh, right now. <laughs> Anyway, this is actually a perfect segue because one of the beautiful things about running is that you're escaping and yeah. you take that with you. I, I don't know people who answer phone calls while they're running. So that I have, know, it actually, is, yeah. It is, it is an escape. So we're very, very excited. Everybody knows Beatty Deutsch doesn't need an introduction, but we will uh, share one anyone in terms of her accomplishments, her achievements, her breakthrough, all without compromising her religious Jewish life, her convictions, her sense of modesty, her humility, really has extraordinarily made a Kiddush Hashem on the scene. And it's really our excitement, our joy to be able to welcome her now on Behind the Bima. Without any further ado, the great Beatty Deutsch. We are so honored and privileged to be joined by the great Beatty Deutsch, still known as Speedy Beatty, or that nickname has fallen away? I think you're still using that nickname. That. <laughs> right, I think once you once you like win marathons and awards and international competitions, yeah. One, once you've been you know sponsored by Adidas, you probably don't have the, still the childhood nickname. But it is a great honor. We're so happy that you are with us, and thank you for giving us your time. Not always uh, convenient with the the hour difference from Israel to America. So thank you so much for being with us. 
Thank you for having me. I'm, I literally am about, I have to avert a crisis with my dog right now. She's honestly, I put all the food away and she's still getting at it. She's crazy. Uh, <laughs> no problem. No problem. We can talk amongst ourselves for a minute if you got to go. One second. I see her like going into the Go, chicken. go. You got this. Go. One, first, one thing we know is she's going to do it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, just timer. saying you and I couldn't run to our door at the pace that she runs a marathon. That's true. Can I just say also, that I'm very excited about this interview. It's the first sport right. that I actually know how to do is run. <laughs> That's okay, true. Cool. There you go. I just so, actually said that running is for everyone. So I believe that everyone could be a runner. <laughs> everyone could be a runner. We're going to get into that. And you know, you, we knew that you were going to get back quickly, so that didn't bother us at all. So thank you again for being with us. And the truth is, I want to begin by asking you, we were just talking about uh, taking our summer vacations, how, how addicted and connected everyone is to technology today. And one of the few times, probably, I'm not a runner. I do like to play sports and, and play different sports in life. I've tried to run many, many, many times. I don't enjoy it. I want to enjoy it. I pretend I enjoy it. I enjoy it when it's done. But the whole time I'm doing it, all I feel are my knees and my ankles. I feel my heart beating in my chest and I can't wait for it to end. But anyway, but people who run, like Rabbi Moskowitz, Rabbi Brody, describe the runner's high, the escape. Do you listen? Do you listen to music? Do you listen to shirim classes? For you, is part of running the ability to escape and to go into some other place? Yeah, definitely. But since I run a lot, I have a lot of options of what I can listen to. So I definitely have plenty of runs where I just want to be in the zone, in my head, not have anything on. Um, and when I do all my workouts and races, I do not listen to anything. But then I I spend all my easy runs listening to Shiurim. And on like my Friday long runs, I'll listen to music. Um, and I, I've, I've like finished like three parenting series and like, I think five of Rabbi Kellerman's series all running and it's really amazing. <laughs> it's very, I feel like I'm working on my body and my mind at the same time. So I come back. If you think just running is like endorphin high, when you combine running with like a Torah class, it's like another level of high. That's fantastic. Now when you're running, so, so you are able to listen to things and you still feel like you're escaping. Do you ever answer a phone call? Are you disconnected at least from the WhatsApp and the texting and the phone calls? Are you at least in another place? <laughs> Yeah, I never answer phone calls unless it's my husband being like, come back right now because some like, <laughs> wild emergency is going on. <laughs> can you can you carry on a conversation while running? Does that affect the breathing or the pace at all? On my easy runs, I can carry out any conversation, yeah. During the workout, you, I'm not talking. Just give Rabbi Goldberg a little sense. When you say an easy run, what mile, like what, what pace are we talking about? Okay, I ran 11 miles today at a 7.08 pace. Yeah, that was you and I would be gasping for air in vomiting what do you mean? if we were. I'm <laughs> passing out just hearing that. That's what do you mean? Already, Rabbi, Rabbi Goldberg can't talk and walk at the same time. That's oh, stop too it. Oh, oh, stop hey. it. Stop <laughs> it, everybody. And what's you said, Friday or your long runs? What's a long run? No, well, actually, Friday are the medium long runs. Medium. And those are between like you know, around 15 miles. And then long runs are like 20 miles and up. Amazing. I guess when you're fast, it takes less time. So it's easier it to really make that is. commitment. It is easier. I always think about people who have to run marathons in, you know, four to five hours. I'm like, I don't know how they're on their feet for that long. You know, I'm doing the two and a half hour marathon. I get out easy. <laughs> so so your, your, your story has gone far and wide. And, and I want to acknowledge and really applaud and commend you for being such a Kiddush Hashem. It's, it's a beautiful example. Um, you've been uh, in so many ways and about so many aspects of, of your story, and you're using it to advance Hashem's vision for this world in such a beautiful way. And that's, you know, we as rabbis, we're professionally trying to inspire and teach people. And we have our pulpits, your pulpit or your sneakers or your ability to, because of your accomplishments, uh, by example, teach people that you cannot compromise our values, our convictions, who we are as a people, uh, a commitment to halacha, um, all while pursuing and chasing a dream. So it's really amazing, and we and we thank you for, for that. Um, when did you know you had this skill? Uh, I know that growing up in Passaic early on, you already discovered this athleticism. How did you know you wanted to take it sort of professionally or compete with it? No, I mean... I was always, I never in my life dreamed that I was going to be a professional runner, even as, you know, a child loving sports. Like when you grow up in a, 
from community the way I did, like you don't you don't picture yourself becoming a you know professional athlete. And I still, when I show up at like the track at like the Israeli track meets, and I just like look at all the other runners, and then there's like me, like the from mom from you know, it's just like what am I doing here? But I I think even when I took up, people also don't realize like even when I took up running. It was only because I wanted to get back in shape, not because I wanted to go to the Olympics. And even after running my first marathon, in which I did know that I was good at running from from that first marathon, but I still never thought it would go. I had no idea that it would take me here. The only the point at which I realized that I could do it professionally was when I won the 2019 Israel National Championship race. It was like an outright miracle from Hashem. And even my atheist coach, he actually was the one who literally told me, he's like, I have no physiological explanation for how you ran the way you did. <laughs> it was a miracle. So I took it. I mean, that was a sign. And then when I was offered, I was immediately offered an opportunity from Israel. And, you know, I asked my Rav and mentor, Rabbi Kellerman, and he very much encouraged me. Uh, I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity. It's been incredible. So you, you compete as a professional athlete, you're competing and in running, you could argue you're competing against the other runners. You're also competing against yourself and your own time. But at the core of it, of the drive that pushes you is a sense of competitiveness. Even before you knew you'd be a professional athlete, do you see yourself as a competitive person? Did you have competitiveness growing up? What's it like today when you play a board game with your husband, with your kids? Do you have that killer instinct that you have on the track? Are you competitive in other areas of life? Um, it's so funny. I think you're the first person, like I've done so many interviews and like, it's the first time you're asking this question. And I always listen to professional runner um, podcasts and they always ask them that question. So you must be a professional runner interviewer, but um, I happen to be very competitive person. But the funny thing is like, I'm not competitive now with board games at all. I honestly, I don't even like board games, but I'm just very competitive with myself. And I really love to push myself. And I find that what I think people often fail to realize about oh. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> realize about the beauty of sport is that it is so, so much more than the physical. When you learn to challenge yourself mentally and you know just demand the best from yourself, that it spills over into every aspect of your life. And I feel like it's channeled all my competitive spirit into a positive thing where I'm really, you know, working, I'm, I'm constantly trying to become the best version of myself in sport. And that means that I want to become the best version of myself in life. So to me, it's so, just this incredible tool Hashem has given us. So could I just pick up on that? Obviously, the mental side of running we always talk about is just as significant, if not more than the physical side. You know, in running, they talk about hitting the wall that you get to a point in the marathon, 20 miles, 22 miles, where you hit that proverbial wall and your body feels like it's given out and your mind is drained and you just got to push through and, and dig a little bit deeper. Um, can you describe that to people who might not be runners? What are some techniques that you use to push through that wall and how can we use that in life? Because everyone hits walls in life. It might be in running, it might be in other areas. What are some techniques you picked up along the way that have enabled you to push through? Yeah, that is a very um, good question. I, def I I actually had never hit a wall in any of my marathons until my most recent marathon, I hit the wall. The thing is you definitely, even with if you don't hit the wall, every workout is a challenge in terms of getting yourself to be able to like handle the discomfort and to keep pushing when you find yourself giving up. So a couple of strategies. Number one is that I've realized how powerful please go to bed thank you um how that was run along <laughs> that, was the, that was the dog not one of the children right. <laughs> exactly. um our mind is the messages like we send our body with our mind just like even even the wording we can use like instead of going to the you know as soon as we start feeling fatigued if we in our mind say, I'm tired, immediately our entire body is gonna feel exhausted. But if we say, oh my gosh, like if you find a positive way to reframe it, like, oh, I have, I, I get to do this right now, or, you know, yes, my body's working hard, or, you know, so then the, the difference, I have literally felt the difference in the way my body responds. So just in the messaging we're starting to work with in our brain, the more you become 
tuned into what messages you're sending in your head, you can see it apply in all areas of your life. The other thing I always say is, is especially with a wall and a marathon, like don't think about the fact that you have to run another six miles. Just think about the next step. And if you can keep focusing on one step at a time, you're going to make it. But the thing that always a lot of times holds us back is the overwhelming feeling of like, oh my gosh, I have so much more left to do. Like there's no way I could do that. And then you shut down. But if you stay present in the moment and just take it one step at a time, you will 100% be able to get there. How did you, you just referenced the, you know, disappointment of hitting a wall. Give us, give our, take us behind the Bima. Give us, give our listeners some sense of maybe you're still trying to work it through and trying to be comfortable within it. We all face disappointments in life. We have dreams, we set goals, and we, you know, we go right back to pursuing them again. You've, you've had enormous success. Your profile has been raised. You've been celebrated. Great newspaper article that just came out a couple days about you. Uh, Adidas, it's got to mean a lot to be in an ad for, for such a public company and to get all the free clothing and sneakers. be fantastic. <laughs> so all, all that's the positive. All that's the part that everyone's jealous. But when you're higher profile, then there's also a bigger spotlight and a lot more eyes on you when you come up short, when you hit that wall. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with disappointment? How do you deal with it with a sense of faith? And how do you fight through and push through it to keep going? Yeah, I'm very blessed that I've, been, I've had time. I gave myself the time and space to process it. So I feel you know comfortable talking about it. Even though the last two talks I gave in person in Israel, there was like, when I spoke about it publicly, like I felt myself choke up, like it was emotional still, you know, and that's real. Um, I think that it's really important to recognize, like if you, if you're gonna, you know, risk something and put yours and live fully to like become the fullest version of what you can be, you're going to sometimes come up short. You're going to experience the pain of failing if you but you can only achieve like those great heights and you can only really demand the most of yourself by by being willing to take those risks and i think a lot of times we don't we live in the fear of like not making it and that then we compromise what we could truly achieve so that was like the first thing just to recognize and like a lot of times i like i'm like ask myself like why do i keep doing this it's hard like it's really hard you know and and it's not fun <laughs> to put yourself out there and then just not be able to make it. But I remind myself that this is a whole process and don't be short sighted that the fact that I failed right now, or I didn't experience quite what I wanted right now, doesn't mean that I won't achieve it later on. And like, think about the whole journey that I'm on. And I really felt like with this, you know, my entire, my entire desire to make it to the Olympics was, I was motivated by, you know, the desire to, to, bring Kavo Chemayim to the world to show that you could, you know, achieve the greatest level in sport and not compromise on what it means to be a religious Jew. And really, you know, in my mind, I thought like, what does Hashem want from me? Hashem wants me to make it to the Olympics, right? That's Ratzon Hashem. But who am I to know what Hashem wants from me? And I recognize that when I didn't quite achieve that goal, when I failed, I thought, I said, maybe this is what, this is, this clearly was what Hashem wanted from me in this ex opportunity. And I had a unique opportunity to fail in such a public way. And someone sent me this beautiful Nesibo Shalom that really just, and he told me, you know, this is, he said, you had to teach this message to the Jewish people. And basically the Nesibo Shalom says that, you know, we talk about Avoda, Avoda Sashem, work. And he says, our chisaro and our disadvantage is that we think that when you do, when you work on something, you need to build something, you need to make something, you need to create something. It's about the outcome. And no, 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 no. It's not about the outcome at all. It's about the yagia. It's about the effort. And the only thing that matters in this world, and it's hard to know, it's hard to really recognize that in a world that we live in that's so physical and that's so results driven and that is all about achievement. But the only thing that Hashem really cares about from us is our yagia and our effort. And if you know at the end of the day that you did the best possible job you could and you put in your effort, you can't ask anything more from yourself because the outcome's not in our hands. And so to me, when I look at the experience, I feel like in a way it was a, it was a chesed from Hashem that I got to share this beautiful lesson with the world for an Olympics that let's be real, I wasn't going to be able to run in because the IOC was not budging about Shabbos. So ultimately I, I feel like it was, a, it's a unique opportunity as well. And if anything, you know, I'm, 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 I'm grateful for it. And 
doesn't mean that I've stopped here. Like I'm motivated to make it to the world championships next year, which I know is not on Chavez to make it to Paris in 2024. And I just feel, you know, I cherish every part of my journey. Wow. What an answer. What an answer. Wow. I'm sure that will inspire someone going through something difficult right now. All of us in life hit those walls. And that gives us a real beautiful context to try to, uh, Work it through and, and get back to work. Rabbi Moskowitz, I know you've got you've got more questions. I got a lot of questions about running, <laughs> about life, about Judaism. But you know, one of the things that I noticed is the the realness of some of your social media posts. Um, I know you posted one recently about Sneas, about the challenges and how on social media it looks so easy and everyone celebrates it. But as a runner, let's be honest, it's it's really hard and it's really uncomfortable and it definitely sets you back in certain ways. I know you wrote one recently about being a mom and how everyone says, oh, it's amazing, you know, children and running and husband. And it's really not always so amazing, as you said, it's really challenging. And it requires naps in the middle of the day and sometimes not putting the laundry away the way you're supposed to. Um, what, is it, what is it like to share so much about yourself and about your journey with the public? You're exposing so much of, of who you are and about, you know, the, as you said, the adversity and the shortcomings and the failures, what's it like to share that in such a prominent fashion on social media? What's the type of feedback you get from people? Um, I would imagine it's very relatable to many moms who read something like that and say, there's a part of me in that, that I can't do it all, that I do have limitations, that there are give and takes in any, in any given day. What's it like to put yourself out there so much and what's the type of feedback you get? So I've always been a person who's like 100% comfortable with myself and I believe in being 100% honest and authentic. I think with social media, there you, you always have to set boundaries. So as much as I do share, there's a lot of things like I don't share and I feel very much like privacy is really important. Like I'll never share anything that's, that's just not, not respectful to share. So I think people have like, I think it's trendy today in a certain way to open up and be real and be relatable. And that's very good. But I think you do still have to maintain boundaries. And I really, I really try and make sure I'm, I'm maintaining my boundaries. But in terms of sharing relatable, like what I, I find a lot of social media, like, like eh, hard to deal with. Like there's so much pressure to look certain way or buy certain things the, the consumerism like it, i i try not to say negative things but like there's a lot of reasons why i wouldn't want to be there so i feel like if i am going to be on social media like it's my it's my obligation to just like show keep showing up in the most authentic way possible so people don't have complexes about how they have to live their life like it's it's scary how damaging it, it can be to the core of like i feel the core of like yiddishkeit really and I think that um, we just need more healthy, healthy role models in our life. Like if that's where people are going to get their inspiration from on social media. So like we have to have people there just showing up and, and sharing it. And I Baruch Hashem have had really only positive feedback. And and the other thing is that I also very much try to if like share things always in a, in a positive way. Like I'm just I just really just like negativity, cynicism, anything. Like if I'm going to share a message, like I'll make sure that it's, that's, that's important to me as well. Do you have um, someone that you run it by before you post it? Do you run it by your husband? Do you have a, a friend that you just run it by and say, is this too much? Is this too little? Is this authentically me? And some run that stuff by? That would be a good idea. I, 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 I <laughs> things by my husband, but I'm also like such a, like in the moment person that I usually like just, like if it comes from, I feel like if I feel the the need to say it, like I want to share it, then it's then it's authentically me. Like I'm in tune with it. And if I don't feel like posting, like I won't post. You know, <laughs> so, it's it's working. It's clearly it's clearly resonating for a lot of people. I want Rabbi Brody to be able to jump in, but I want to first ask the follow up for the, to the last question, which is as a public person, you get a lot of unsolicited feedback from every direction. We know that as rabbis, and and you have a larger uh, platform in many ways. So. Who's giving you more pushback and how do you overcome it? When, when you've accomplished what you have while running as a modest woman, is it from the community of people who say, you know, BD, it's ridiculous. Why are you wearing a skirt? Why are you wearing long sleeves? Why are you covering your hair? You could accomplish, you could achieve so much more. Drop those archaic, prehistoric, misogynistic, male-imposed definitions. Just drop it all and run like every other woman. Or do you get pushback from the other side who say, 
You know, I don't care how covered you are. It's not Sanua to be running. It's not Sanua to be competing in public. It's not Sanua to be celebrated. You know, I, you don't have to tell us where you get more because it's important, important. We want to keep it positive the way you were just describing. But I guess the positive message I'm looking for personally and all of us to draw strength, how do you shut out the noise? How do you not allow the negativity, the criticism in and say, I have my rebellion, I have the people I consult, as long as I make Hashem proud, my family proud, I'm proud, I shut the rest out and I just put that one foot in front of the other. I don't want to hear it. I don't need to hear it. Yeah, I'm very lucky, Bar Hashem. I mean, I think it was instilled early on from my parents. Like, they always raised us like, we don't care what anyone else does. We don't care what anyone else thinks. Like, this is how we do it. And this is what we're going to do. And my father is like, couldn't care less what the world thinks. So I have it genetically. I was raised with it. I was always like, you do you. If you know what you're doing is MS and right. And I mean, I 100%, I have a rub. I have mentor. I have like, I wouldn't, I always ask questions, but it's never bothered me what anyone else thought about me, you know? And I think it's, it's important if people write negative things, like don't engage with them. Most of the time, they're not actually looking for answers. Like you're just gonna, I don't know. I think people get more worked up and upset when they enter into useless, pointless arguments. If you if you know what you're doing is is right, just keep doing it. Don't worry about what other people think, you know? And actually my Rabbi Rabbi Kellman always says like, it's so important to learn to, to think for yourself. Like part of acquiring Das is the ability to use your brain. Like just if you're constantly worrying about what everyone else is saying, like you're not living for yourself. So I have never ever worried about what anyone else said um, to the end. And, it, and even if, you know, Baruch Hashem, I really don't get a lot of neg negative comments. I, I made a decision that I, 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 if you live in a, like, you know, I respect whatever community I was in. I was very careful to respect my communities, like, you know, their level of sneas and and if, if it's not comfortable to run in, in in the neighborhood i live in so i won't run in the neighborhood i live in i respect it even if i think differently um and i i chose schools where i i'm 100 percent respected and appreciated and my kids could be proud of myself like that was that was a little bit of a trend you know had to find the right place in Eretz israel because yeah not every school is on the same page as me but i found it Baruch Hashem, and um yeah, I'm, 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 I shut out the negativity 100%. And I think that if you want to be living your best life successfully as you, like you really have to focus on what's good for you and your family. And not, no one else matters. Nothing else matters. If you, your family, and Hashem, you know, that's all. That's it. I love it. Rabbi Brody. Wow. So first of all, it's great speaking to you. As I said before, I get sometimes made a little bit of fun of. I'm not the biggest sports guy with football and baseball, but I know how to run. That's the only thing I've ever done. I grew up running in South Africa, and I still run. Rabbi Moskowitz had a group that we put together to do a half marathon. Never did it before. I haven't done one since. But it was definitely a great experience. And I remember just saying to myself, okay, that's mile five, mile six, mile seven. Got to, you know, mile 12. I said, okay, now we put the Rocky music on, and we're going to go right to mile number 13, blast right through it. All of a sudden, you get to 13, and the race isn't even over yet. What's it, 13.2? <laughs> Talking about a wall. I couldn't, I, I couldn't, the song was over. I didn't know what to do. I just couldn't go. I <laughs> keep going. But but it was great. I, I still have my T-shirt on here. This is from that day. Rabbi Moskowitz. Wow, we did it for right. him. We raised and, a lot uh, of money that day also. A lot of money. And the, the one thing that I'm just wondering wondering about, as the conversation is, is, has been going on, you know, I grew up in, in, in Cape Town. I remember every day that first of all it wasn't such a long school day i think it's probably similar to israel where it's not as long as it is here and i remember when i started fifth grade i, th I, th I think the day ended at five o'clock at night i didn't know what to do with myself they said no don't worry during the day there's going to be exercise you're going to be ex i said what's this okay we have something called recess you go outside for 10 minutes and you, you stand around eating snacks i was always wondering it always bothered me you know like the yeshiva day school system never really encouraged you see it a little bit more down in south florida but never really encouraged a lot of uh, exercising, certainly not running. And I'm wondering what you see out there. Is there something we could do to improve that? Running, after all, doesn't take a lot. You don't have to run so fast. You can run a little slower. You can jog. Is there something we and our schools could be doing better? I think that it very much varies within the community that you're in. Um, and I think that we have made a lot of improvements. Like when I was growing up, 
There was no, you know, I actually used to do gymnastics. I couldn't even do gymnastics because there was no like girls gymnastics to do. So I stopped that. And then I wanted to do Taekwondo and it was like, I was the only from girl in the Taekwondo class. And like, so there was no outlets really in sports for from girls. But today I see it's really changed. I think what still could use like some, I think, First of all, for people to realize the, the health benefits of getting out and moving your body. And and I mean, I also have seen a lot of improvement in that, but to continue just like encouraging. In the last five years since I started running, I feel like in Israel, I've seen so many women take up running. Many women have told me that, you know, I inspire them to do that, which is just so incredible to hear because it changed my life. Um, I, I think we could continue to give girls like, I mean, and boy, really everyone, you know, real opportunities to, to, I think co competing is good. Like, I think learning to push yourself, learning to fight all the skills, learning to work with your head, like there's no cross, there's not really so many cross country, like, you know, opportunities for, for high schoolers. And I think that would be cool. I mean, I might be in the minority here, but um, I, I would love to see more of that. And I think it's just, the more that you, you know, sport, you see religious, you know, people able to pursue sport at a high level, the more it will become normalized and encouraged and people will want to, to get involved in it. So we're slowly getting there. Great. Can you unpack the modesty post a little bit more for us? Um, it, it was beautifully written, but could you, was the emphasis that modesty is a beautiful thing and you don't have to compromise it even while you're running was the emphasis that even when modesty doesn't feel like the most beautiful thing it's what god wants and that's the most important thing so even when you hit the wall so to say of not wanting to do something what has to push us over or around or under or through that wall is remembering that we answer to him and what god wants is the most important help us un unpack that modesty post a little bit more for us yeah you know the truth is like I always grew up just keeping tzniyas because that's what you do, you know? It was like just normal and accepted and I didn't have any questions about it. I, I'm an easygoing teenager, I don't know. It was, it made sense to me. So I didn't struggle with it at all. Um, and it only came up as like something that I had to think about a little bit more on a deeper level um, when I, you know, started getting all these questions, when I started becoming more serious in my running, even when I first picked up running, it was, of course, of course you run in a skirt. Like I wouldn't even, you know, think twice and it didn't feel like any, any problem. But then when you start thinking about your time and you see what everyone else is wearing and you're at the track and, you know, you sometimes run at your, in the treadmill in your house and you know how good it feels not wearing all that clothes. Then you start to like think about it. And then when people tell you, oh, come on, your elbows, like how silly could that be? Like just wear short sleeves or like, come on, a skirt, really? It doesn't make a difference. And you start to like med think about on a deep level, like why am I keeping this mitzvah? And I've definitely, like I also work in a college campus and I taught so many girls about modesty and I had to explain myself all the time. And there's a lot of reasons that I, I, that, that made sense on a certain level, but then when it came to like understanding why specifically like these kind of, like I I can't wear clothes in sport, like I couldn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily have a good answer for myself that I could present to the world. So I just felt like, but I thought about, I always feel like a mitzvah, the whole purpose of a mitzvah is, is to create a relationship and a connection with Hashem. Um, and if, if I am in a relationship with God, you know, and I literally had an example where like my husband asked me something like in my house, he was like, can you not hang things on the door? And I'm like, why? Like, I don't care. And then I realized how silly that sounded like he just asked me because he clearly doesn't like it. So it doesn't matter that I don't care if he cares about it. I'm in a relationship with him. So I should care about it. Right. Like it's so obvious when you think about that. It's the same thing. I'm in a relationship with God. Do I know why Hashem cares about every single detail? No, not always. After 120 years, I can go have a nice conversation with Hashem and ask him and hopefully I'll understand more. But I do care about that relationship. So to me, that's the prince. That was just the underlying principle. And and the fact that I know so untrend, like when, when you're an athlete, it's so easy to just think like, oh my gosh, I worked so hard. I showed, I, yeah, I work really hard. Like I, 
you know, put in hours of work and it's, it's, it's intense and it's draining and I can, and you can easily get caught in that mindset of like, oh, I worked hard and that's why I achieved those results. But I know that at the end of the day, doesn't, every single result I have is only because Hashem gave it to me. All my strength comes from him. So it just felt so like to remind myself, wow, I am keeping the mitzvah of Tznias is about a character trait that I want to live with my entire life. To be modest, we all want to be humble. We all want to know who is the source of our strength. So even if I don't fully understand the connection between why wearing these clothes is going to give me this midah of tzniyas and why as a woman I have to do it even in a competition, I know I want that midah. I know I want to remind myself that whatever race I win, whatever you know podium I receive, whatever outcome I have, it's all from Hashem. He's the source of my strength every single day so so educationally what you'd say you know i have a lot of daughters and thank god they're all wonderfully beautifully tzniyas we're very proud of them but there have been periods of you know earlier in life of, of fighting and and so would you say that educationally whether it's in schools or whether it's at home for parents the messaging about tzniyas ultimately you're not going to win an argument about the mitzvah the big meta argument should be about relationships hashem expectations how we see ourselves are you, are you offering a a methodology about how to inspire tzniyas also is that what you'd recommend to parents and teachers i wish i could say i have like a methodology on how to inspire tzniyas i think it's a very touchy topic for many girls like like, I don't know, I wrote in the, I'm not a fashionable person, so like clothing never much mattered to me. But if you're like, I don't know, I think that ultimately every mitzvah has to be about relationship with Hashem. If you work to have your child really understand what that means and to be like, like want to make the mitzvah personal to them. To me, it's about finding your own personal connection to why you're doing this. And, and then, and, and, the, and I think it feels more real that way. Like you are connected to the mitzvah, you're invested in it. You realize like it's, it's a way of me keeping in touch with Hashem in my life every single day. So that's, that's my approach. Ramaskos. All right. So, um, you know, we spoke, we started off the conversation speaking about taking time off Rabbi Goldberg's vacation a little bit, disconnecting during runs. But I think one of the things that was the biggest um, most novel idea for me when I was training for a, a significant race was how important recovery is to that process, right? You generally think that you get better by just going out there, run, run. I know you swim, you're putting in long hours, it's competitive, it's hard, it's draining. And the more you push yourself, the better the outcome. And one of the most important things my coach taught me very early on was that unless I took care of the recovery process, I would, one of two things would happen, either get injured or burn out very quickly. So as a professional runner, and again, I want to broaden the conversation a little bit as a general principle in life, as we're approaching the summer, a period of pulling back a little bit, what have you learned from recovery um, in terms of the running world that can be applied for people who may or may not be runners as well? <laughs> you can ask my husband. I literally, every time I like get a good night's sleep or take a long nap, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just run so much better when I have more sleep. And he's like, we've been telling you this for like years. It's very hard. It's it's hard to just, you know, shut, r recognize that so, like less is more. And that like sometimes all the hustle and all the busyness and all the needing to get everything done and is not, is, is not effective in you being the most present in your life and in you being able to get the most out of yourself. Like you said, you we really do, need to take a step back and i think and and to be able to give ourselves the proper recovery like i literally try and take a nap every day um i know that's not realistic for every single person but like i view it as a part it's a part of my job and if not like i have no problem saying like i'm i'm going to bed at 10 o'clock you know that's what i need to do um and i think that like sometimes the world today is a little bit of a rat race like everyone wants to look like they're getting so much done and being so productive and doing so much and I was, I'm a, I'm a type A person. I was there. I was like that. I wanted to constantly be doing things. And, and, and I've just, the more I've gotten into running, actually, I say the faster I run, the more I want to slow down. And the like beauty of it's like, I, I don't think we want to let our lives just like fly by. Like when you are able to give yourself the proper space, the proper downtime, disconnecting, recharging, taking the time you need, even just, you know, as parents, I think we need to fill ourselves up to be that overflowing cup for our family. And if you're constantly 
you know, chasing things down and not taking a break, you are going to burn out. You are not going to be able to be present with yourself or your family. And really the loved ones in your life are going to suffer as a result. I once read the book Born to Run. I don't know if you read that book. We're going to let you go soon. You've been so generous with your time. But about the Tamaruma tribe, I'm mispronouncing their name, I'm sure, who run barefoot and people like older people run 40, 50, 60 miles at a time. They run huge distances with no problem while they're running barefoot. Did we lose Bidi? He's still there? You guys still there? I'm here. Rabbi Moskowitz, Rabbi Moskowitz, have you ever ever run barefoot? No, but I remember in- Not run barefoot. I have no interest in running barefoot. And when I've used minimalist shoes, which is part of that same genre, I have not had positive experience, so. Yeah, I remember w- yeah. wa- watching the 1984 uh, running uh, running on the Olympics. There was a South African runner, Zola Bud. She was always running barefoot, and she and there was a major issue because she when she crashed into an American, and uh, they didn't know whose whose fault it was, South Africa or America. So I'm using yeah. my I, okay. It is here. back. We lost it for a minute. No problem. No problem. We'll take that as a message that we should wind it down. The hour is getting late for you, and we so appreciate your time. But just, just. Uh, I was mentioning I once read the book Born to Run about this tribe in Mexico who run barefoot and they can run 40, 50, 60 miles, like insane numbers. And and the thesis of the book, or at least the tribe, what they were teaching was that sometimes the more technology that we introduce, the more we injure and harm, and the more simple we keep it, we were designed to be able to run that way. Have you ever run barefoot? you have any thoughts on that? I don't really run barefoot unless I'm like at the track, maybe on the grass at the end of a workout. Actually, the one, the lesson that I took from Born to Run, it's in the car, in the X, yeah. The lesson that I took from Born to Run, um, that like actually really, cha- you know, changed the trajectory of the marathon. I was, I read it right before a marathon. Um, was just they said the secret to their success was they run out of joy, and to me it was so powerful. Like. When you let go of all the like fear, worry, doubt, anxiety that consumes us on a daily basis of things we're trying to, you know, and just go from this place of joy and, and trust and amuna, like, and I thought about Rabbi Sinimima Mizrahi, who always says, like, from Rabbi Nachman, Mitzvah Gdola, Liot Bisimcha Tamid, like, I had a really good marathon the next day because I was able to incorporate that. So, yeah, they have some powerful lessons in there. <laughs> They do. All right, I'll ask you one more question and we'll let you go because we know you're balancing with your family and your dog and your sleep and everything else. What, let, give, give us one more message about somebody who is setting a dream and pursuing it. You you didn't even know you had this dream until you discovered it. Now you're pursuing it. Thank God you're, you're achieving it. It's got bumps along the way, but you've achieved an enormous amount. Give us one last message about making it, setting ourselves a goal, having a dream, and not letting things hold us back from pursuing them. You know, I, I think the biggest thing to realize, I used to always say, like, I mean, I still I still 100 percent believe it. Like, it's a big thing. Dream big. Like, don't don't limit yourself to who you are right now. Be, you know, willing to imagine a future you, you, you can't possibly see in the moment. But because you have no idea of your true potential. And the crazy thing is, like, I've seen all, all the goals that I really thought were, like, totally impossible. I'd never achieve. Not only did I get there, I, I realized I could go even further. But I would say what I've learned even more, especially recently, is, like, you really cannot let the obstacles you face along the way deter you from achieving those goals. You know, it would be so short-sighted if even after one, two, three, four bumps along the road, ten for you to quit, you know? I always remind myself, Sheva Yipo Tzadik Vakam, and I just, and I, it's so hard to, after experiencing failure, to keep going because you begin to doubt yourself. It's, it's humiliating. You don't want to get up again. But I think some of the greatest, like, things that have been accomplished only come after the failure. So it would be silly to stop on our journey just because we didn't hit our goal the first time. Bidi, you are a great source of inspiration. Thank you for spending time with us. We know you've been pulled in a lot of different directions. We appreciate your recognition that Behind the Bima is the podcast to be on and uh, and spending so much time with us. 
in an inconvenient hour. So thank you. And thank you for being an inspiration and such a kiddush Hashem. And Hashem should just continue to give you strength. Hashem should give you that wisdom. And uh, I know you'll never stop running, but if or when you stop competing, go on that motivational tour because you also have a lot of uh, great skill there as well. So thank you for your time this evening. And we wish you only brachat slacha nachas from your family. You should have only the best of everything. Amen. Amen. And I just want to give a shout out to Behind the Bima, the rabbis who are so innovative and coming up with new ways to reach your congregants and cool podcasts and using all the up-to-date technology. Like, really kudos to you because it's not easy in this world. And it's amazing to see how you got, you're constantly, you know, innovating to find the best ways to bring Torah to the world. Thank you so much. And regards to Rabbi Kellerman, he's been to our community. He knows us. So please send him our best as well. Okay. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. Wow. I, I knew we were going to learn a lot. I knew we'd learn a lot about running there and, and kind of about dreams and goals and coming up short. I didn't realize how much wisdom, Torah wisdom and right. context and perspective. And she's got it together in, in all those ways. I took a lot out of that. What about you guys? I, you know, a lot of it resonated. I think two points that I would just point out that really, you know, when she said it, I said, oh, that, that's, a, that's amazing. I didn't really think of it that way. Number one is the joy of running, um, which again, obviously for me has implications in running, but I think it's just a general philosophy of life that something could be a burden to you or if you frame it in the context of a joy, it totally takes on new meaning. And I think we could apply that to anything. If you find the joy in learning, the joy of davening, right? Things that sometimes can be a little bit more tedious. If you reframe it, um, it could be something that's a blessing, something that you're running to do. I think the other thing for me, which is really just a validation, is how so much of our life that we view as physical limitations, so much of it is the mindset that we bring to it. You know, she described how even like a small tweaking of the way she thinks about something, the way she approaches something, that in and of itself will dictate how, you know, the way her physical body reacts to it. And again, I think that's such a great lesson for so many of us in life outside of the realm of running where we have these perceived physical limitations or limitations in terms of our ability. And so much of it is just saying to ourselves, no, I can do it or putting a more positive spin on it. And that changes the entire mindset and our approach to it. Yeah, running as a metaphor for life. I, I, I plan on keeping it as a metaphor because I have not been able to find that joy. I went into listening to her. I was almost tempted to say, I'm going to start running this summer. But I just everyone has to know what they like. Right. You exercise with the way you like to do it. So you, the key is to not stay still, but you got to find what you like. Rabbi Brody, are you still running? You talked about running. Are you running? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I just... <laughs> I, I've been running. <laughs> I've been running. Tell us about I your love running. running. I love running. And... um I think that there will be people that are going to watch the show and be inspired to start running. It doesn't mean you got to run a marathon. Go for a jog every day. They say that not only do you start burning the calories that day, a 15-minute to 30-minute jog, you'll end up burning the calories for the next two days. So it's like one of the gifts they just keep on giving. And it's it's not so hard to do in terms of you don't need any technical skill, again, like football. You know, we can argue from today to tomorrow about baseball. I don't think it's much of a sport because, like, you're really not doing anything. You're standing on bases and just waiting for a ball to land in your glove. Yeah, just millions but, of people. But you know, it, yeah. yeah. But you want it exactly. There's millions of Americans who, who who could be outside running instead of doing nothing. But <laughs> so, so, what's your running? What is your running schedule? I love running. Like? What's your, what's your running? No, so I go to the gym in the morning. But I actually started running this week again. I'm trying. To, it's part of my new regimen to actually to to. Uh, I'm on. A, I'm on like a, a special coming out of COVID regiment let's just say i'm not going to call it a diet but i just want to get get back to where i was pre one and a half years ago and i am really really working hard at it i'm just running you listen eating you listen not stuff? eating you listen yeah. while you run or you don't listen i only listen to music i've tried listening to other things like sure i've listened to books on tape i just can't keep I, it, it it bores me and i just end up slowing down put on music and i'm just like phew, like a bullet now there are websites i haven't seen this with jewish music but during the like 20 minutes of my life where I got into running, there are websites that if you put in the pace that you want to run, it creates a playlist of songs whose beat goes to the pace that you want to run. Did well, there are know? apps that do that also. There are apps that will match your pace together with the beat of a song. So that's a... Also, everyone should know, and I, should, I want to throw it out there, that if you're living in Boca and you're listening to this podcast, there's actually a WhatsApp group of runners, um, people who motivate each other, encourage each other, sometimes even go out for runs with each other. Rabbi Brody, I'm happy to include you. Rabbi yeah, Goldberg, please. when you're ready, I'm happy to include you also. But I think so much of it 
Is Maybe you can add me after, an, right after I beat you in tennis. <laughs> <laughs> so much of it is that running is an individual sport. And I think there's, there's a beautiful community that's created around it of people who are motivating and pushing each other and encouraging each other. That's actually interesting. I've tried running with other people over the years and I find it doesn't work for me. You know, it's, I always feel like maybe there's, there's like, I have to start talking and I don't want to talk. I want to just run. And it's just like this pressure. It's just like, why do I have to feel pressured during, during something which I find so enjoyable? It's weird. I, I just can't do it. I liked her. I liked her metaphor about being mindful, staying in the moment. You don't have to picture how many miles are left. You just have to take that next step. I, I, the drush I gave this past Shabbos was about the the Miraglim, The spies came back, and their whole message was, you know, there's a lot of possibility, a lot of potential, but also a lot of risk of going into Israel. And in the end of the day, lo nucha, we, we can't do it. Let's just stay here. And Khalid gets up and he says, Alo na let. What are you talking about? You are right. All those risks are there. All those obstacles are there. I agree with you. I see them. You're right. But let's do it nonetheless because we can do it. So that was that was really her message is, you know, what what's your attitude? And I, I mentioned this mountain, which had not been summited, second highest mountain after Everest, K2, I think it was called. And it has not been uh, summited in the winter ever until this past January when it was. 30% of the people who try to summit this mountain die. I actually feel bad because in the drusha, I basically said, what kind of crazy meshugana morons? If, would you engage in an activity that there's a third chance you die? No. Die. Not a third no. chance you'll break a bone. There's a 30% chance you're going to die. No, there's like a half a percent chance. I'm anyway, but somebody I respect a lot and I really have come to love and I'm excited he's coming on that trip this summer is like, yeah, I scale mountains, I summit mountains and I know the risks and I love it. And I really respect him so I felt bad that I had said that. I'm still learning about <laughs> it. But anyway, but, but they interviewed the people who made it to the top of that summit and you know, how'd you get here? And expecting some long, you know, complicated and as the frostbitten fingertips were thawing, he said... One step at a time, just one step at a time. So whatever you're going through in life, you're going through a crisis, a hardship, a challenging time, you know, the metaphor for life kind of thing. Just, just one step. Just be in the moment. Don't look at the, don't look at the end of the marathon. Just what moment are you in? Just put that one step in at a time. We got a lot more to talk about, but we are speaking of time, out of time. Another great episode of Behind the Bima. Not great because of us. Great because of Beatty Deutsch. And if you want more people to hear her inspiration, her lessons for life. Her context, her, you know, we didn't explicitly say it, but she failed to qualify. She said it for the Olympics, and that's a big setback. Adidas sponsors you, and the newspapers covers you, cover you, and, and the Jewish world is ready to go to bat for you to be able to compete on Shabbos, and you didn't make it. And, and the way she put that in a context, and she's ready to keep going, I found it so, so inspiring. Hopefully those listening will as well, and help us get that word out. I want to applaud our audience, because a couple weeks ago, you flooded Richie Torres' office with gratitude for his standing with Israel. Last week, the day after buying the Bima, someone came to me and said they called uh, Bob Menendez, Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey, who's the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and brought the plight of Hadar Golden to him. And now Bob Menendez hopefully is on it. Who knows what it will yield? But when you listen, it's not just entertainment. When you're listening, often there's homework and action items. You guys have responded well, and we appreciate you getting that message out and making a difference. So thank you to our uh, listeners. Huge thank you again, Danny and Emily Agion. Rafur Shlema to Danny, our hero, donating his kidney, thinking about him and his recipient. Big thank you to Fran and David Wolf. Everyone should get their copy. Torah IQ, if you know the answer. Four boys born in an hour, four bristles on four separate days. Let us know the answer, and you will be eligible to win a copy of the great book Torah IQ. Until next time, which will be our last time for now.